Yeah, so thanks, Stefan. Um, yeah, and indeed, I hope this is just a continuation of uh, the lively uh, the debate that we had uh, since, since yesterday. I was a bit puzzled when Stefan asked me to moderate this, given that I'm a development banker and usually don't think about making stories except as a consumer and an uh, avid uh, TV series uh, producer. But then I thought, actually, it's exciting to talk about now a bit maybe about the commercial aspect and what it, make, what it means about making stories, selecting stories, and so so maybe so I will put a little bit my banking hat on, but not too much. Um, and um, I'm so I'm actually just starting off. I think we have a bit of an understanding what a writer does in um, in writing a script, thinking about uh, thinking about sort of the the protagonists of the storyline. But what does actually a producer do, and how does a producer think about? Frank, you said earlier that uh, there are 500 new series. Um, so what to watch so, or what to produce. So what does a producer do and how, Tom, how do you decide um, which stories fascinate you and why would you want to put also, I guess, some money <laughs> uh, in backing them? Well, I, I, the good news is I don't have to put a dime in anything. <laughs> so I'm at no risk. Uh, the, uh, as was explained yesterday, uh, the... Um, the, uh, you know, I pitch to a studio, the studio takes the financial burden uh, uh, from that point on, um, including me, paying me, which is <laughs> a really important part of the process. Um, uh, you know, in, uh, I, I am what is now called a showrunner, uh, even though that is not an official title. Uh, um, it, it seems to be, it's like, it's like being, um, it's like being a cardinal. You know, there is no actual cardinal. It, you become a cardinal, but you're really, uh, you're really just an archbishop. <laughs> so I, uh, we showrunners are cardinals and archbishops. Um, and what, what um, um, you know, what I do as a producer is to, um, uh, beyond uh, just hiring uh, of the people who uh, service the show, the writers, the directors, the actors, the crews. Um, I, I deal with the studio and the network in terms of anything from censorship to the, my financial responsibility. Just because I don't put any money into it, I have a very, um, and a lot of showrunners don't, want to accept this as part of our, our job, but I have a responsibility to the studio and the network to deliver the show on time, uh, on budget. Um, and so I have, over the course of uh, many, many years now, learned how to read a budget, learned how to interpret a budget. The hardest was, of course, the, uh, when I did Borgia, because we, was, the, budget, the budget was in euros, dollars, and Czech crones. And uh, my knowledge of Czech money is fairly limited. So, um, so that's, that's basically what I do um, is to, uh, well, actually, there is something else that I do, which is um, you have to become, uh, because there's so many people involved in so many uh, opinions and, and egos and agendas, you have to uh, be as um, you have to sort of be a really good parent. Okay. Um, you have to treat everyone uh, equally and with the same respect. Um, and um, you learn not to yell uh, um, uh, because the yelling, the more you yell, the less impactful it is. Um, and I, in a way, that's almost the most important part of my job. Not uh, yelling. Not yelling, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, not, not letting my ego take, uh, dominate the entire enterprise. Because it, when a television series works the best, it is a communal effort in which every single person is contributing, hopefully, the best of themselves. And, um, so that's basically what I do. In terms of how I uh, 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 choose the stuff I'm going to work on, um, as I said to you before we started, every single show I've ever done has come from a different place. Borgia, for example, was brought to me 
by Ken Plus. They said, we hear you like the popes, that you've always wanted to do a show about the popes, which was true. Uh, and they said, well, we'd like to do a show about the popes. Um, uh, uh, Oz was something that came out of my uh, experience, both, um, you know, uh, just very quickly, the, there was a riot in Attica, which is very close to my, uh, the town where I grew up, the city where I grew up, and um, it, it affected me very deeply, not just the fact of the riot, but the way in which the government, the, the state government, uh, basically went in and killed everyone in order to stop the riot. And so the whole thing sort of sat in the back of my head for a very long time. And, uh, and then when I was doing Homicide, um, and we were dealing with all these uh, crime stories, I thought, well, we, we should do a show about, um, it would be good to put f faces on these uh, men who are in prison, because I think once we send people to prison, at least in America, they, they stop being uh, human to us. Um, anyway, so it's varied reasons why I do the series that I do. But this sounds interesting in the sense that it was more triggered by current events of what you experience at the moment, because and a lot of them became then quite prophetic, uh, foreshadowing actual um, happenings in society, or the sort of so the so the interplay of how prophetic a, a show can be um, is sometimes a bit seems to be can be also accidental. Or do you in have particularly case, it's have partic <laughs> particularly <laughs> sort of a uh, sort of a, a, when you when you decide you, you think it's, it's the innovative element, or it's because it's new, or no one has done it before that makes you more interested in doing a show? Well, certainly when it comes to stuff like Oz, um, yeah. that was an opportunity to do something that had never been done before. And to, I'm always think that the shows I should do should push the boundaries mm. just, just enough to get me in trouble. <laughs> and um, and so, so yes, that is appealing to me. Mm. Because I think we do have this incredible, this incredible uh, thing, television. And um, I think we misuse it more often than we use it correctly. Um, and I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. But um, I, think, I think if we have the opportunity to tell um, stories that matter, we have an obligation to tell the stories that matter. Mm. Yeah. So Frank, you're also deciding and thinking about what are the new stories to tell. And I mean, that's also the theme of, of the discussion. So, so in your role for, for Sky on Drama, so what makes you decide? And what do you, what do you think about when, when to deciding um, what are the new stories you want to tell? Um, how, how do they come about? What's your role in sort of selecting among the many stories that you could tell? My, my part is to, um, uh, or my task and my privilege at the same time is uh, to define which show we're going to produce and um, we're going to green light, so called, uh, and get into production. Um, and as a first step, get into development at first, because we develop, uh, we have a de so-called development slate um, with, uh, let's say, a dozen shows uh, at the same time that we develop um, the, um, um, the writing process uh, from uh, a very early stage that, that we have just a, a short pitch, from a short pitch to, to a first script for the pilot episode or an outline for the whole season depends on what is already there, and depends on the talent who's, that is involved. And so the first step is to decide um, which project we're going to develop, and then finally, uh, which of the ones we have in development that we're going to green light in the end. And yeah, what is it, what, what does a show need to have to become a Sky show uh, for us? Um, at first, we had to define what do we want what, what do we think is a, is a Sky show that, um, um, first of all, has to differentiate from the rest of the program that is offered in, in Germany for our German audience? And so we uh, screened the market, what is already there, what is in production, and um, the conclusion was that serialized program is uh, more or less 
uh, was a sleeping beauty, uh, non, non existent uh, in the German market because we had a lot of TV movies, made for TV movies, or still have a very strong market in Germany. Uh, we have a lot of procedurals uh, going on, but we, we didn't have the serialized shows. So, um, and by nature, since we are uh, a cable, uh, let's say a cable sh a company or a so called pay TV provider. Um, by nature, that is a format that in the US was very successful uh, with HBO and, and others. And also in various uh, European countries like Canal Plus offered already program. So um, to make a long story short, basically we just took the US shows as a blueprint <laughs> in terms of it has to be um, more daring than any network show. It, it uh, has to be more explicit. We can we can really show more sex and crime. Um, t um, to be honest, um, and all these these relevant uh, um, factors. Um, so this is the basic framework um, or the foil that. Every show, every pitch we receive, we, we take a look at where does it match? And if it doesn't match at, at uh, no point, um, it doesn't make sense for us to get into development uh, with the show. Sometimes it's just one criteria that um, fits. Um, or it's, a, it's really the talent behind it. Let's say Babylon Berlin, for example, the first show we, we uh, commissioned together with ARD. Um, it, it, it really made a big difference that it was Tom Tickwer and two of uh, his friends and colleagues, um, Hank Kantluck and Achim von Borges, um, that that was the creative team behind the show. Um, and not a, let's, not in, uh, shouldn't sound disrespectful, but not an average TV uh, director uh, who, who did a couple of procedural um, episodes or whatever, but really uh, someone who came from the movies, a cinematic uh, director. And so it was a great opportunity for us to jump, jump in just because of the talent. And we thought the, the world of Berlin in the late 20s could be something like the Pendant to Boardwalk Empire in a way, for example, as a reference. And yeah, that, that's basically uh, how we approach or that, that we take a look at the, all the pitches we receive. And it's uh, still up to, I would say, 200 pitches per year that, okay. that we receive. And it'll, it's a lot of stuff to read and to get through. And it's, um, again, not re disrespectful, but it's a lot of stuff that really um, isn't of the quality we wish it would be. Um, but still, there is enough um, material we think that is um, intriguing. And um, beside the, the, the things I mentioned before, there's also really um, what we are aiming for is that we have uh, creatives that have a strong, unique voice mm -hmm. that you really can see or that you can read in the script, in the lines, that this is someone who really tells us, wants to tell a story in a very specific dramaturgically specific way. And did, did you really see the talent? Uh, and it shines out of, uh, again, the average shows that are uh, week by week um, having the case of the week or whatever. So we try hard to, to find um, the uh, foremost the writers in Germany, because this is where it all starts, of course, naturally. And um, and, to get, and, and develop together with, uh, with the writers, uh, or the writer. Sometimes it's, in the beginning, it's mostly uh, just one uh, writer that, that brought the thing, the pitch to the table. Um, yes, and, and, and that's a very strong uh, point we are looking for, to, to have a certain uniqueness, a certain voice that we can hear. And with this voice, um, because a lot of the discussions we had when we were looking over the last 10, 15, 20 years, that um, there's a certain increase in darkness in, in TV shows and certain increase in crime and violence, potentially, but also just a sort of a more dystopian view of the future. So do you see when you see the, all the sort of stories that are brought to you that there is a certain trend or um, to a more 
um, dystopian worldview stories that are more. I, I wouldn't say the, the, there's violent, a trend to attended. dystopian, but there's definitely there's a trend to genre. Mm -hmm. that, that, that that's for sure. Um, we got a lot of genre stuff, um, fantasy, mystery, um, um, and and and, and um, catastrophe uh, stuff. That, uh, I brought uh, a short clip um, with me from, from yep. our show called Eight Days. Um, let me say just two sentences. It's basically a story about the last eight days. Uh, not dystopian at all. Not, a, <laughs> no, not dystopian at all. Um, an, an asteroid is approaching Earth and, and will um, get down in, in, in Central Europe and nearly and definitely destroy completely uh, Europe at all. So people had to <laughs> either get away to America or to Russia or to, to really um, sort of become, in a way, refugees. And um, yeah, w but it's more character driven. Besides all the, the the hustle and bustle that is, of course, naturally going on when you only have eight days to live. <laughs> or at least try to, to survive in, 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 in any way. Um, it's a strongly character-driven drama and brings, out, and brings out the best and the worst in, in people. This is just a sizzle reel or clip. It's, it's not a real trailer. Budget, we try to <laughs> tell the end of the world. Um, of course, it's never enough budget. Um, Look good, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'd watch. Sorry? I'd watch. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, you, you, you as a producer probably know that you, you always are aiming for more, or yeah. um, probably yeah. a, a director more than a producer. You, you're the one who has to, to keep it down. Well, yeah, I mean, it is, a, it is tough balancing um, your ambitions with, uh, <laughs> with the realities of, uh, yeah. of what you can actually make. But, um, but I, 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 I've also had a very good line producer who manages to uh, navigate, you know, because the way I was taught was that if you're going to spend a lot of money on one episode, the next episode you don't spend so much money on it, and you try to balance out the overall season as opposed to the individual episodes. The bottle episodes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing, uh, because you asked for trends and, and things like that, um, when we started the project four years ago, when, when they pitched it to us, I, I was intrigued just by the basic idea of what if, you know, what if an asteroid comes down to Earth and you only have eight days to do, what, what would I do? And that was basically the thing that stuck with me. Um, and, and when we started it, it was definitely uh, for sure that everyone will die. And um, after a while we thought, this is really depressing. <laughs> Just watching people eight days. In, in the beginning, of course, everyone is doing whatever they wanted to do, yeah. kill someone, having sex, whatever. But this is really boring after a while. And then uh, we changed the course of the storyline a bit. Um, but, but you can see there's, there's um, a lot of people said now, oh, this is great that you have the refugee um, topic now built in the series, and, and suddenly, all of a sudden, we Europeans are becoming refugees, and we see the other side. That was, when we started, when we started to, to write the show, um, the refugee crisis was non-existent. It wasn't oh, there boy. at all. So you see, it's more or less coincidence um, that something happens or that um, reality. Is it maybe is it a predictive power of television that you have just stronger <laughs> sensibilities to these it's a themes? self-fulfilling prophecy. Like with Trump, we, we had this with Trump, the dis discussion that uh, House of Cards couldn't top the actual reality of American politics anymore. So uh, I mean, hopefully there's <laughs> not an asteroid approaching Earth <laughs> before, we, before we air the show. Oh, damn it. <laughs> we really hope so. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're all hoping. <laughs> Maybe more so. <laughs> Not the main theme. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, so, so, yeah, but uh, what we really like, what I liked about the show is that it's contemporary, that it's um, something that is here and now, and that it deals with issues, uh, moral issues, of course, because what are you willing to sacrifice? You know, for example, it's a st story about the bunker. There are only so many places, and if you have a family of four, but there's only three places left in the bunker, mm, I have two <laughs> kids, which one is the one I love more than the other? Something like that, you know. Um, 
um, the ambiguity um, that, that comes up uh, in, in, in characters. That was something that, that uh, really uh, intrigued me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I like about the idea, though, is, I mean, it's even more, it's so basically human that we all are waiting for the, you know, we walk down the street and for a safe to fall on our head, you know, that, that it, 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 all of us anticipate what could happen, what catastrophe could happen at any moment to any of us. And um, it sort of like approaches that, um, that anxiety in a, in a really interesting way. Yeah, and on a collective basis also. <laughs> yeah. It's not one safe, it's... Yeah, but I mean, I as an safe. individual viewer can yeah. see it from the fact that I have those same fears even though there's not an asteroid coming. Yeah. There's some sort of asteroid yeah. <laughs> coming. Damocles yeah. <laughs> uh, asteroid. And so we had a lot of discussion about responsibility of um, the, the creative, uh, so the responsibility of the telling true stories, I think Sasha was saying the balance between tr truth and beauty earlier. So, I mean, in a context like this, did you feel some responsibility also maybe to just, I mean, yes, you, ha you already said you, you didn't let everybody die. So <laughs> is there some responsibility you felt that there should be some uh, I positive <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it responsibility. I would just yeah. call it, because it's a series, you really have to make sure that people are going to watch the next episode. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the cliffhanger that you want to know, ooh, does the safe really hit him deadly, <laughs> or uh, will he survive, or whatever. But, um, but also um, giving hope and, 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 and that, that there's more to come and that there are, uh, that there are paths to, to choose for our characters. Um, but I wouldn't call it responsibility. It's really more or less a creative thing that, that we all wish for, that, that, that you tell an, an, an interesting story that, that's gripping and, 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 and that you want to follow. Because series is totally different to a movie where you can tackle something, um, let's say a serious issue like the NSU in Germany, you know, fascist right-wing people. But to make a series out of fascist right-wing people is very difficult because you, you, you need to find an angle that you want to watch them every week. Yeah. It's not like, okay, for 90 minutes, we're going to tell you a story about someone who did something very bad or, or, um, or will, will do something in the end very bad. And, uh, probably it is a catharsis or not, but it's it's cl closed. You know, it's it's a closed story. Um, but whereas a series really needs to, um, yeah, to keep uh, to keep the interest um, up um, uh, by the audience and. I don't know if you... you Do you see you, also you, limit or like a different stories to tell as a series? Well, I, I was curious how many episodes are in the... Eight, eight episodes. <laughs> <laughs> We're telling 24 hours. And there's no season two. <laughs> uh, the, we, we think about... Uh, I mean, because you could do the story of what happens to the survivor. Sure. I mean... Um, we, we discussed this just briefly, um, but there will be ways, of course, but you, you can also set the story two years later, you mm -hmm. know, something was rebuilt already and, and the society is working again or wh wherever you want to start. You don't have to necessarily start season two right the day after uh, yeah. the collision. Um, yeah, so it's possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the things I'm working on right now is developing a uh, limited series um, uh, based on the book uh, Failsafe and the movie that Sidney Lumet directed. And um, it, it, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm going to spoil the ending. Um, <laughs> the uh, final moment of the book and the film is uh, the President of the United States drops a nuclear bomb on New York City. And of course, the network said to me, well, what's season two? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that. So, um, yeah, we go to a different location. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's like Chicago. Yeah, this enough. year we're going to drop the bomb on Chicago. We'll work our way across the continent. 
The responsibility comes, of course, more with uh, period pieces. Um, I guess you, um, you did a lot of research, of course, and oh. have uh, consultants, historical consultants, for example, for, for Babylon Berlin or for Das Boot. Um, uh, this season, we, of course, we have military advisors and, and consultants. And I think there's more responsibility if you set a story in World War II you have to stick to some facts at least. You can't come up with a, um, a, a new version of, of war um, unless you fictionalize it completely. Um, but uh, on the same, at the same time, you, you need to dramatize things, of course, and you need to find a way um, that it's not a documentary about U-boats uh, in, in World War II. No, sure. So there's definitely the responsibility of the sort of historical facts and accurate. But then I think the the story that you tell, um, or the stories even about the same subject that are told, follow some sort of historic discourse. I mean, so when we discussed this morning, it was quite interesting to see the difference between West Wing, this sort of idealist version of American politics, and then you have uh, House of Cards and uh, these very Machiavellian characters, and so. Uh, I think, th so then you were actually, I think you remember asking, uh, what does it do? Does it fuel us now accepting people that are more Machiavellian more, or does it um, reflect it, predict it, um, is responsible for it? Yeah, <laughs> I, I just mentioned an example earlier um, about a show that we had in development about uh, of, uh, a woman who was the party leader of a right-wing party, uh, but not um, a sinister and, and, and dark one, but more like uh, Le Pen, uh, uh, intelligent and good-looking and um, um, so, probably, yeah, sophisticated would be too much, but uh, um, uh, eloquent uh, woman who is very manipula manipulative, but at the same time, uh, uh, she, she's definitely not an evil woman. So, but we try to define the thin line. How can we make her, um, in a certain, to a certain degree, sympathetic? That you sympathize with her, or at least have empathy for her, but still, she's the, the leader of the, the wrong party. You know, of a party no one wants to be a, a member of. And we want to make clear that no one should be, become a member. Um, and maybe it was uh, not the right combination of, of uh, writers involved, but we had, uh, after a while, we really thought this, it doesn't work out the way, uh, it, it, it might backfire if you don't do it really 100% right and you don't find the right line uh, to tell this story. Um, because it's a very delicate uh, issue, of course. Um, and. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe someone comes up with, with um, a new setup or, or um, finds the right way to tell such a story. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but there, there of course, comes a great responsibility. Um, because either you're really, in the end, you're stupid or, or, or you're kind of a fascist yourself, and that's definitely <laughs> not something we want to intend. To. Tom, did you ever think about uh, make this deciding you not to support a story at the end? You think you can't tell it in in the right way, or it sort of would not come out. You, you felt your respons you couldn't live up to your responsibility of. Uh, um, I would say that I my uh, career is littered with um, uh, ideas yet to be fulfilled. <laughs> okay. I uh, I refuse to abandon any idea. Um, that's how stubborn I am. Um, but I, I think, you know, in terms of like a moral responsibility, I think, uh, you know, uh, with Oz, I was trying to push it as far yeah. as I could, um, uh, though I was very um, uh, aware, given that there were no rules at HBO, uh, certainly at the time that I was developing the show, that, um, that I had this responsibility, that it was my responsibility, and I couldn't blame the network for intruding on my creative process. So, um, uh, it, it, you know, in terms of how to use the sex and the violence became very, very much uh, a part of my decision-making mm. process through the whole 
run of the series. Yeah. yeah. Stefan, you had. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would be curious. I mean, um, we've been talking about um, truth and beauty, but you should also talk about, maybe say something about money. Um, and um, I guess, you know, the, your two perspectives on money might be slightly different. Given, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, may, maybe I, you know, the, the, the question for Frank would be, you know, how patient are you now, right? I mean, in some sense, um, you know, this is... Um, it's a, it's a new project, uh, it's a big project, could potentially you know, pay off in the long run. But do these things have to be, commer I mean, if you look at uh, Acht Tage now, does this have to be you know, commercially successful in the long run or is there some um, you know, considerations that building up the brand, building up Germany as a place uh, that can you know, do this stuff and building up Sky as a brand for, Sky Germany as a brand for a series, you know, may pay off uh, in the long run. So, you know, I would be curious a little to know about the commercial pressures mm -hmm. that rest on this. And then when you say, you know, you were, you're looking for, uh, when, when you look at pitches at the individual voice and, you know, can you see um, the creative powers, you know, to what extent do you think there's a conflict between you know, the things that you really like uh, and uh, the commercial potential. And, and that's also a question, I mean, sort of the similar question that I'd like to ask to Tom, that, um, you know, if you have a project and uh, you really, and somebody green lights it, um, but deep down you know that it will commercially, or that it's commercially maybe problematic, but you, you like it for artistic reasons, then, I mean, is there, I mean, are there considerations that you say, I take on something that is going to be a commercial flop, maybe they're not going to hire me again in the future? I mean, so to, to, what, to what extent is sort of the, um, you know, the market side, um, the demand side driving your, your supply decisions? You want to go first? Well, uh, oops, sorry. Um, regarding to uh, success, um, how do you define commercial success? I mean, um, Free TV defines it by ratings. You know? The networks in the US and also in Germany, they air a show, they see the ratings on the next day, and that def decides or defines if it's a success or a failure. Um, of course, we want people, our subscribers, to watch our shows, um, but it's a bit more complicated or complex, I would say, because it's not just one linear airing at 8.15. Um, it's several reruns in, in pay TV. We have on demand, nearly 50% of our users uh, watch the shows on demand now, um, are, are serious. Um, and so we measure more or less the first week of an airing and, and see how many people watch the show in, in, in this time span. But then again, you have like awards, you have um, sales, international sales. Um, so it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, def by definition. Um, and I mean, we, we just started with Babylon last uh, year, so um, there will be three shows coming up by um, the beginning of October, Ach Tage, then we have this boat, and then we have another one called uh, Der Pass, which is loosely based on the bridge, uh, the tunnel, uh, German-Austrian variation. And we, we will have to see how these shows are doing. And, 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 and then we will um, see if we have to readjust uh, our definition of success <laughs> <laughs> accordingly, <laughs> or if we still, if, if we still stick to our um, <laughs> old uh, definition. Um, yes, so, so since we're at the very early beginning, it's hard to tell. But for us, it's really also, it's something that drives, of course, the brand sky itself. It's something that we, w we want to give our subscribers something exclusive. If we want to give them content uh, that it's worth paying money for, and that um, so, uh, but having said that, it's really that the, all our shows are compared to average German shows, high budget um, shows with a high production value. Um, so that you really have the feeling, okay, I pay a lot of money each month uh, for my subscription, but in return, I, I really get something. Um, and the, the second question was if, if there's a, 
gap between what I think is uh, would be a show worth doing and uh, if it's a commercial, I wouldn't say so. Um, I think um, what we what, what what we do so far and what we have in development, all of the shows are really shows um, we, we ourselves, uh, the team would, would love to see uh, on screen. And we, but we also think they have the commercial potential. It's not something we, that we are into art house uh, series now. Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I, I'm uh, lucky that I don't have his job because. Um, I, I couldn't imagine figuring out uh, what's going to be a successful show or not. I, I mean, my, my role is simply to get an idea. And because making a television series is so impossible and so much hard work, that if, um, if as a writer, um, I'm not excited by it every single day. I, uh, I can't imagine going to work. Um, so I just come up with an idea. I go to men like him and or men and women like him and say, uh, here's an idea. And, and they get to say that's right for us or not right for us. And so uh, the, the sort of commercial decision isn't really mine, uh, mine to make. Um, Though I've had many flops, I've never set out to make a flop. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, but, but one ha one has to really think uh, of the, the um, um, how you say the percentage of failure or um, of shows that um, get another season um, is so high, and it's it's really something that um, yeah you have to be aware when you when you start in this business probably as a writer that um, you do a lot of things um, that w will not return or will not find an audience in the end. Yeah, most of but, the stuff I've done. Yeah, yeah but, but still you have to pretend. But still you have to think uh, this. Yeah. This will be this will um, be the, the next yeah. big thing. I mean, the the uh, fr very first television series that I worked on, I didn't create it. Was uh, Saint Elsewhere, and um, and uh, the this was there were only three networks, and uh, back then that's how old I am, and um, there were a hundred television shows being shown and broadcast television. There was no cable, nothing. 100 television shows. The first season, St. Elsewhere was uh, 99th. And the lowest rated show was Cheers. And fortunately, uh, the, the, the Brandon Tartikoff and Grant Tinker, who ran NBC at the time, said exactly what you said, which is, why would we cancel shows we're watching? And they picked both shows up, and, mm. and you know, obviously, Cheers had a much longer life, but um, but yeah, it's uh, I'm uh, I'm always in awe of uh, network executives who trust their gut as much as they trust the algorithm. <laughs> Do you ever think about these sort of? taste communities or sort of niches of interested uh, communities that would be particularly interested in the show or you think something you are fascinated by this idea and you I, I, you know it's I back when I was in grade school I had a nun who said um, um, if you have a question raise your hand and ask it because someone else in the class probably has the same question and my shows are all based on the questions that I have, so I don't actually think about anybody else. I just think, well, I have this question, maybe somebody else does too. Yeah. Do you ever think about, um, sort of, because syndication is such a big topic, do you ever think about, or is it just the German market, do you think, or nationally, we talked a bit about well, national, so also about whether, do you think yeah. about a specific niche, or also do you think, like, Tom, oh, I like the show, there will be enough people to like the show. There's, or the show will be popular in Germany, but maybe there's a potential that people in uh, other markets yeah, will probably, like it. Probably that, because uh, first of all, we really think uh, that we should tell local stories that resonate uh, with our audience in Germany. Um, so we're not um, um, looking to the US market or uh, some other country. It's really first, 
Germany first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but I think uh, the Western world, there are, this, there are universal topics, there are universal things in storytelling. And um, if you have the same, in the Western world, we all share the same values, more or less, until now. Um, things might uh, differ. Um, but uh, so I think, especially in drama, I think the shows, they, they will find their audience, um, uh, more or less, uh, in the rest of the world. And um, we've seen it with Babylon Berlin. It was shown on Netflix in, in the States. And uh, I don't know how many other countries already. Uh, or Deutschland 83 also made its way around the world. And we have a strong um, interest in, in eight days also. Because in the end, it's. Okay, we tell the story set in the outskirts of Berlin and, and Berlin, but it could also be Paris, could be London, could be Copenhagen or Chicago, probably. Um, because well, that's my second season. New <laughs> <laughs> York, <Yeah>. Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, dueling apocalypse. Yes. <laughs> All doom and gloom centers yes. around Chicago. <laughs> So, but uh, just one, uh, one uh, afterthought to what you said before, um, what we're picking up. So, if, if, if we receive a pitch or if, if someone pitches us a story, it's really one of the questions that we like to grill people is, with, why should we tell this uh, story now? What is it mm -hmm. that we should, why should we do it now? Especially with period stuff. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's really like a bit, it's, it's a bit random, you know? Yeah. You yeah. have the feeling, okay, uh, <laughs> we could do this 17th century thing, but I don't know how does it connect mom uh, momentarily. Um, so what did they tell you about uh, Babylon they Berlin? Come, they come up, <laughs> no, Babylon obviously is, you can draw a lot of parallels uh, with the Weimar Republic and, and uh, the times we are. I don't want to stress that too much, but um, it was done in the media already, and I think to a certain degree it definitely is, uh, uh, is so. Um, yeah, but sometimes, you know, there's some obscure historical um, character or figure that people want to tell uh, the story, uh, or especially if it's more or less uh, one character, bio, uh, not a biopic, but a bio series or something like that. Mm. You really think, so, but what is it, why should we do this? Now, what, what, is it, what is it that is so interesting for, for our audience that we should tell the story? Of course, they come up with some fantasy <laughs> <laughs> thing. That's why we're writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. We create while we're pitching. But, really. <laughs> but we love to see that if you come up on the spot, you, you know, if, if, you, if you, you notice exactly that no one ever thought, have, had us thought about this. Yeah, yeah. And in the pitch, it's like, well, you know, it's because <laughs> they come up with something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had such a sort of uh, interactive discussion previously, so definitely please all uh, feel free to ask questions, interject before sort of the apocalypse centers on Chicago. <laughs> you all. I, I don't yeah. Poor Chicago. I have, I have one question um, that um, we talked about, um, or there was this topic about Germany focusing on the German market and not so much trying to, to write for an international audience. Um, do you think that's changing in another way in the US that people start to write more for international audience or less for a, for a purely American audience? Or does there, is there no shift of perception and it's still focused on? on I, I haven't seen it in terms of the narrative. I've seen it in terms of the uh, co-production. I think, I think now it's like, in terms of the money and the market and all that stuff, the, the real question is, well, um, will this play in Germany or will this play in Italy? And can we get some money out of them to, so we're not taking quite as big a loss? But I've not been pushed. Well, the, uh, yet another thing I'm working on is, uh, which I think I mentioned yesterday, is, uh, is set in Rome during the, uh, the 1954. And the one thing we're doing, which I'm very excited about, is um, the Italians will all speak Italian, and the Americans will all speak uh, 
our version of English. <laughs> and, um, and in some scenes when the Americans are with the Italians, uh, they'll be speaking in Italian or they'll be speaking in English based on the character's knowledge of either Italian or English. Um, and um, uh, we're, so that's the way we're going to shoot it. And what I find exciting about that is to be able to say to an actor, don't worry about the, uh, the English. Don't, you know, to an Italian actor saying, don't worry about having, because I think that gets in the way sometimes when, it, when and, and it works both ways, but when somebody's trying to speak in a language that is a second or third language for them, the acting sort of gets, uh, stuck in the middle, you know, between, oh, am I saying that right? So I'm very excited by the prospect of, of this sort of dual, uh, dual storytelling, if you will. Sasha. Now one uh, technical question. If you say that about Borgia, which is uh, very interesting for me, um, how do you write in, Ital in Italian then? Or how are you supervising the process that this is actually of good quality? The dialogues. Will, are you uh, employing an Italian Italian writer? Then? Yes, yes. We have we have three Italian writers uh, who I've been working with. Um, what I do is I write the um, scripts, and uh, the Italian is all in italics because sometimes we go back and forth, English to Italian, English to Italian. So the only way, if you want to read it and say what's in Italian, what's in in English, uh, you read it, you know, based on the typeface. And then the Italian writers will be um, uh, turning it into uh, uh, Italian. So that they're not translating, let's say, what you just agreed upon, but they find their way of saying it. Yes, yes. Because well, I've been working the with them. Uh, they, they've written part of the second episode. So they already have a, a, you know, a, an investment in, they probably, I mean, they wrote it in Italian initially. Um, but given the changes that we've made, you know, they now have to re-translate uh, it. Right. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't say that it, it's a perfect system or that it works, but um, I just, it, for me, you know, the idea that this is something that I've never done, it makes it very exciting to be a part of, mm -mm. you know? Do do they do both languages? Like, do they speak English and um, they, they, one of the one of the three speaks uh, English well. The mm -hmm. other two not so well. But then again, my Italian sucks. So, so. do you have like a translator <laughs> working between two of you, or how do you coordinate we, that? Because we have that too. We, with we do with have somebody who also helps us uh, when in communicating. Um, yeah. Michael. As long as we're talking about actors, it, it's my experience that I enjoy certain people watching them. So there are certain actors, it doesn't really matter too much what they're doing. It's the way they do it that, I, that uh, amuses me or, or captures me. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I'm sure it's not just a big name. It's simply the way somebody carries him or herself that then carries the story or the interest of the yeah. of the viewer. How how does that enter decisions, casting? Well, I mean, the casting process um, is, I think, maybe the most crucial thing um, uh, because um, not only do like, oh, I have this character up here, and now I've written this character down here, but um, you really want the character, I mean, you really want the actor to take ownership of the role. You know, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, uh, I'm always saying that th there's a moment in the life of a series where each of the regular actors, um, uh, there's a moment when they own it. In the, in the beginning, I know everything and they know nothing. And then after a certain point, I don't know anything, so I have to ask them <laughs> about their character. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's, and you want that to happen because it becomes a really uh, wonderful moment of creative bonding between you and the actor. Um, but in terms of initially casting, um, you know, sometimes it's person walks in the room and you go, that's it. We don't need to see anybody else. And sometimes you go, all right, let's take a chance. And it works out. And sometimes it doesn't work out. But it's a, it's a 
it, it, there's no science to it. It's, it's purely a, a crapshoot. Yeah. And sometimes it, it's subject to availability. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> so whoever's around only yeah, available yeah, yeah. will get yeah. the job. No. It seems always that a lot of it is sort of really also your sort of individual vision and decision. Is there any sort of, because I mean, so in the world I'm, I'm in, a lot of decisions are made by teams. Hmm. So we decide on teams and then, yes, I can have sort of a final decision if this uh, wind project gets financed or not to have an example, but there's a lot of team analysis. But um, I think in the creative process, probably different and there's much more of, an, of your sense of um, the creative, what you want to see. Or is there also a sort of dis there, there's discussion? A, there's team. a lot of conversation. There's <laughs> consensual, a lot of consensual. There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of conversation. Um, but I will say that um, most of the places, the networks that I've worked with, uh, will defer to me ultimately. Um, but um, there is a lot of conversation and a lot of, um, you know, uh, my attitude about uh, about the conversations that I have is um, I don't know everything, I just know what I know. And so if somebody gives me a piece of information that I don't know and I can use it, then I, then I, then I, I go, wow, that's great. Um, the tendency sometimes, depending on the network, uh, and I'm sure this is not true of Sky Germany, <laughs> <laughs> um, is that is that whatever is the most recent hit um, it becomes the 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 uh, you know the measure of what should you know so if you're doing a show uh, 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 about uh, New Jersey and there's a show on Amazon about giraffes you'll get a note well, why don't we add a giraffe? giraffe and, <laughs> and you go, well, I don't yeah. know that there are giraffes <laughs> in, New Jersey. <laughs> in New Jersey. There must be a zoo. There somewhere. must be a zoo, <laughs> yeah. They don't have to be running around. Yeah. They can just, and, and that's, those are, the, those are the notes you get very suspect of because you go like, oh, come on. Mm. That, that, before that writer had that idea that became a hit, he was probably or she was probably getting notes on the previous hit and either resisted it or added the giraffes. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, our motto says the next big hit has no history. I love that. I love that. I'm very good uh, phrase to end uh, this part. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very good phrase to end uh, this part. And also, Stefan was pointing at his watch to me. <laughs> The second cue. Uh, right. to, to thank you very much uh, oh, yeah. to the panelists, and we're looking thank forward you. to. <laughs>
they can't, um, they, they basically can't turn the ship around. So they, the, you know, we're, we tell our story always from the point of view of the East German leadership, and it's from the point of view of these uh, spies who are working in the world on behalf of the communist project or the socialist project. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we see it. And this is a little setup, and it, it has a lot of music in it, that this piece, so yeah. Okay, no one's ever seen this except for us. So, and there's Naomi who works with me. So we're, here we go. I find this a very good um, point to start because I remember when I was first reading about Deutschland 86 and then seeing the first trailer, um, I wasn't very interested in it. Mm -hmm. I was seeing it and it was like, so, yeah, this, it, it wasn't this. Um, programming slot of RTL, of this event movie thing, and it was a little bit um, marketed at that, uh, as, as that. And then I remember it was one of the, the series festivals, and they showed the Sundance TV trailer. And I didn't know in the beginning Don't what- Don't get me started. Uh, yeah, what, what kind of, no, <laughs> yeah. What, what ki I didn't in a, in, a, in a second didn't know what kind of series <laughs> the trailer was for, mm. and I was just like, okay, whatever this is, I have to watch it. And. I think that shows maybe this, this um, what we want to talk a little bit about, this European perspective and maybe here a, a very German approach compared to a, to American approach, how to sell your show and how to generate interest in your show. And um, how was this for you? How much um, influence do you have on, on, on something like this? Like how to sell part? your show? On how to sell the show and how to, to trailer it? Yeah. Not at all. No. Um, I mean, this is a complex conversation. I think we were first out of the, you know, there, there wasn't any example of kind of traditional American show running or kind of a show like this in Germany. And it was an amazing experience in a way that RTL commissioned the show and they were very supportive of the execution process and the, the you know, yeah, the, the whole, thing of making the show was great. Um, but then it was on in America six months before it was on here. And so we had the experience of what it's like to roll out an American show first with the, with the marketing, which of like a you know, writer-driven show and all that. And that was uh, great. For, for me, I mean, again, I'm a novelist. You know, it was my first time making a TV show, so I sort of thought that was the way you do it. And they were very respectful, and it was very, you know, they often asked me what I thought about all kinds of things, right? This is in terms of the rollout, not the execution, because, like I said, making it with RTL was great. Um, with the promotion of the show and the programming of it as an event movie rather than as a series when it was like specifically written as a bingeable series, which is like, you know, I'm a novelist, I wrote it. I think writing to this kind of TV is, is a lot like writing a novel, you know, like writing chapter. You know, the idea is to want to keep watching it. Um, and then they to just told us that they were going to do it in like 90 minute chunks like movies because that was their time slot and that they were going to make it as a Christmas special and that they and then they showed us the trailers and stuff which you know weren't um, we I had nothing to do with it so I think it was a learning process and it's um, in that sense it's really different working with Amazon because because the other thing is you know we were talking about flops and all that like our show was a huge flop in Germany and the lead question always with journalists when they interview me is like how does it feel to have you know written like the biggest flop in Germany or the most famous flop in Germany or whatever and that always feels great that question <laughs> and I'm always like let me list for you all the other flops you know <laughs> no, I'm joking no it's just it, it's not a great feeling but it is a weird experience because the show didn't do well here but it did well everywhere else and then it was recommissioned in 109 countries but not in Germany. So that was for us, which was weird, because I write in English anyway, so I'm like, all right, why make more if, if no one wants to watch it in Germany, you know? Or, or I'll write something in English, you know? Yeah, but, this, is a, this is a very interesting point, because mm -hmm. I remember, um, I talk, uh, talked about this yesterday shortly, um, that when I was first researching for a festival, I was a totally serialized, and people asked me what are the big German shows right now that I should watch or that are upcoming. And I say, I, I don't know, I don't really have a recommendation of something that does something completely different mm -hmm. in you. 
And a year later, everybody um, it already was, was screened in, in the US and in other markets. And not it was on in the, the Berlin Alley. Yeah, and, yeah. and then a lot of people came to me, though, and now we've seen Deutschland 83, and this is amazing, and this is such a great show. And I think this trailblazing, um, a kind of show that, that hasn't been done before in, in, in Germany, also this, this perspective on, on history and making it, I um, don't know, not as drab and as serious as we were used to. Um, was very great, but um, that I find it interesting that this kind of storytelling was more recognized in outside of Germany than, than inside of Germany. Well, there's an audience for it naturally outside of Germany. I mean, I don't know. It's very, it's very hard for me to say. I, I saw the theme of what we're supposed to talk about, and you know, I just don't really think in terms of European stories or American stories. I just think uh, what Tom said, and I just want to say, I want to say something about Tom, which is that I've worked with many people who have learned what they do under Tom, and I've incorporated many of the ways that he gives criticism. And it's just such an amazing thing, because they, I've learned a lot about how you work with other writers from things that other writers learned from you. So it's really like very special. But um, the, I think what he said, you know, I always write just what I'm really interested in. And I don't, I mean, I'm half British and half American, and I grew up in Kenya, and I have lived here now for 16 years. So I don't know where I land in that, in that ethnically or whatever. But I, um, yeah. So, so it was, it was really, it is weird always to say, like, why did an American write this show? It's like, why not, you know? Yeah, maybe you need the outsider's perspective on something like this. But um, you, we, you, you both also have worked on both sides of, in both um, markets. You're currently, you told us yesterday you're currently um, traveling, shuttling between LA and, and Germany to work, uh, to develop a show. And um, you obviously also uh, worked for in, in German cinema and worked for uh, with the mechanic too um, with a with a American studio. How do you perceive this um, difference of of work or the, the different approaches to to writing, producing, directing? Um, is there something that affects you in your daily work, or is it? It, it actually, I think it changes right now, because uh, talking about German series, like four years ago, was nobody was watching it. In my peer group, for example, I wasn't watching it. I, 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 I stopped watching German television like a few years ago, which is actually a shame because when you look into the TV movie market, it's much better than people ex expect. Uh, normally, and I was in a jury like 10 years ago, and I was like astounded about the quality. Yeah. But um, talking about G German series was something nobody watched. Yeah, in my peer group, my family, we just stopped watching it, and um, it, it changed. Yeah, during to due to all the all the good stuff which is up on on television. And right now, I think both sides change. The audience changed. Uh, all of my friends, they are watching TV series only. Yeah? And they stopped watching uh, uh, German um, movies in the cinemas because they say, look, I'm too old for Fuck You, Goethe. And um, I'm not um, interested in super art house. So there's nothing on for me. So there's a whole new generation. Uh, in my generation and also for, for example, for my wife's generation, they are like uh, eight years younger and they just stop going to the cinemas. And what they do is watch Netflix, watch Deutschland 83, watch all the, the good stuff and Tardort. So that's what they, they watch. So, and I think at the same time, the, the industry changed that um, the way the German series or German series out of Germany are commissioned and developed is pretty similar to the US. It's even better because you don't have to, to deal with these uh, fuck ups over there and the, the, the politics, which is really annoying, especially talking from a director's standpoint. And I think uh, it's, it's a golden age because you have like the, the international approach and the creative freedom. And um, yeah, I think that's it's, and, and it all changed within like four or five years. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. How, how do you perceive this? That um, you, you said yesterday that um, it's it's sometimes difficult to think and to um, to do this. What do you call deep thinking in a in another language? Is it how is it to adapt to the to the other to, to a different approach of, of working? Or is this is there none of none such thing? Does it become more internationalized? Oh, there are many things. Um, first of all, I, this looks like big fun, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah. Even so really dark. I, I absolutely agree with him. I didn't. I saw just like 40 minutes of, of, of Deutschland 83, didn't like it, thought it was too naive, da da da, lost any interest. I see that now, I'm going to watch this now. Um, I have made the same experience. Biggest flop. Uh, yeah. you write a, I wrote a novel and, um, which was selling very well in, in, in English speaking world. So the German would say to me, I like your novel a bit. Although this, your hero is an asshole, and every other England, from England or America or Canada or Australia would say, "I love your novel because it's an asshole. It's full of assholes. <laughs> it must be even written by an asshole. I love it. Yeah. That's why I bought it." And uh, this experience in Hollywood, I'm not writing serious. Here, is that when you get a deal and when they acquire the rights for, or they pay you for a script, that's because they like you. That's because they want it. And not like here in German TV, where they don't give a shit if it is, if it is you or somebody else, or you will succeed or not, who cares? They are, since it is personal money, people who invest in you, invest in you as a person as well. So first of all, they trust your expertise. expertise. You don't have to trust, like here in Germany, as a, <laughs> you have to trust no matter whether you are for 30 years doing it, or for one year, you always have to prove that you are a talented writer. It's like going to the dentist for 30 years and he has to prove that he is the dentist. <laughs> so there, the, the first big difference was for me that they like, when they hire you, they like you on the way you write and they trust you and, and they like what you do. That is the first big difference for me. I'm yeah. not American. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, is this maybe um, one of the, I think one of the biggest um, things that was um, told about the German system is that there's not enough trust in the writers and that the commissioners are meddling all the time and giving notes that um, when, that is when you... That uh, in my experience. In your experience, huh? Mm -mm, I love the people I worked with at RTL, actually. I, I really have, huh? yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's interesting because um, this is um, right. just one right. of the, I think five years ago, this was one of the biggest things of writers saying, we gonna do the stuff we want because there are people always um, sitting there who are commissioning this and, and thinking they know everything better. But yeah. this is an interesting experience that there obviously is a better site to it or people are learning. Yeah, I also think that, you know, it takes a village to make a TV show and you have to find the people who, you know, want to live in the same village, and you just don't make it by yourself. It's not like writing a novel, you know? So it's more important than ever to find, from the very beginning, I think it's so important to work closely with the commissioner, because otherwise, there's too many layers in between, you know? I think it's important for the writer and the commissioner to, to really agree on what they're making. But do you think, um, of, um, as a question to all of you three, that there's a different, um power balance between, um, I don't know, commissioning um, part, the producer, and the, the writer um, slash director? Because of this is, if you look at other European countries, there seems to be another relationship between those three, the producer more taking the part of um, helping the writer to, to envision their, their, um, their ideas. And um, in, in in Germany, it often seemed that there, there is more like a, a, a working against the writer. Or this is a, oh, what see, people like Annette Hess, why, for example, I'll tell you say. something that's weird, is that in Germany, there, there shows are kind of generally, there's this role that doesn't really exist in America of the non-writing producer, mm -hmm. right? Like in what we do, it's like, I'm the producer too, my husband's the producer too, but we're also both writers. Like there is no non-writing producer, you know? And, and by the way, Amazon doesn't give us notes. Don't tell anybody that. So, you know, I still kind of miss the people from RTL because I sort of liked, I liked those relationships. But I, I like Amazon too. But they don't have commissioners, so it's there is no person like that. But the um, writers are the producers. So it's, that's that's how, and, and also young writers. And this is something that having worked with again people who trained with Tom, it's like what's so amazing about young people in America who are coming up doing what I do is that they're all ready to like go to set, talk to actors, deal with costume, deal with, so much comes up all day long. You know, it's, it's just writing the script is like the beginning and then there's everything else, you know? And uh, Naomi works with me really closely as a, as a junior producer and actually was even my writing assistant on Deutschland 83. So she's been there from like day one. And, um, 
so she has a lot of experience with it, but there aren't that many young people here who've ever even been on set, let alone like, you know, involved in the nitty gritty of making something. Whereas that's, I would say the biggest, for me, the biggest difference between Germany and America is, is the issue of the non-writing producer versus the writer producer. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it also changed within the last five years. So um, sometimes I go to, the, to, to my old film school in Munich and um, give a lecture and like, five or six years ago, a lot of the writing students were kind of frustrated about the situation because everything they wanted to write about was, there was no market for it. Same with directors, by the way. Yeah, so directors, it's, it's like, I'm, I love genre, and for example, there was no chance, or it was really hard to do a spy movie in Germany, or to do a movie about World War II, or to do a thriller. It was just like non-existent, and if you look at German cinema right now, and I did a kids movie uh, last this year. There's, it's comedy and kids movies, so everything. And right now it's a new dawn, everything. If you want to do, like there's a chance to do a spy uh, genre or like Das Boot or something. And so all the directors say, thank God, finally, it's here. Genre is, is revived. It, it, there's no, maybe that it's not the time and place to, to find genre in German cinema. Maybe it just doesn't work. Yeah, but it's a golden age of television, so everybody goes there. Same with writers, and it was really hard to, to find writers who would think, okay, we don't know what we want to tell, but now it, it changed, so everybody is just hyped about doing TV series, and I think that's, and, and, and they feel that they have the power, and um, they're treated much, much better these days. And um, for example, we are doing now a series for, for Netflix and um, it was, I, I, never, I never got so many, uh, how do you say, commission or people who called us up who wanted to be part of it. And I said, really? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like, it's like changing everything. Like, but we are also doing Jim Knopf. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really bad. But the Netflix thing is in. It, it's just a pile of, of people who want to work with it and it's, older writers, but it's also a lot of new writers. It's, it's sexy again. And that's, I think, the, the crucial part of it. Wait yeah. till they've made the first season yes. and they're totally exhausted. Yeah. No, I'm not. <laughs> See if they... <laughs> you know, well, let's wait what comes out there, because now we are on the right, the big hype. The, it's the silence before the storm. We have to wait for the storm. Mm. How, 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 how strong it will be, actually, because it's a lot of money involved. And I can feel that the people who are now coming, you tell a joke, they say, make a series out of it. We can make 15 parts of it, <laughs> and we want to shoot next year. What these people will tell you when you present the, what will it actually cost and how much will it be? I'm now in this um, negotiations, for instance, with Warner about the thing. They love the idea, and now I have this still the skepticism of working 30 years here in the, in the business with the people, the same people, will you really, for instance, allow us to be the creative, um, be independently? Will you, will you bear the, the, the pressure of giving a little bit of this responsibility to us? Because that's what, what it is now. It's all about giving the responsibility or the creative power to the creative people. And this shift, it's slow. It's in like Germany. the old church. Of course, we have new ideas, but this is the church, and this is the pope, and these are the old things. So I am I'm very happy about all that what happens, but I'm still skeptic that this is all going to be so wonderful as it, as it seems to be now. Mm. But this, this is something that, if you, if you look at the success of some of Nordics, or the Nordic series, there are some of the good stuff from, from Great Britain, from BBC Channel 4, that it's all about the producer empowering the, the writer, or the, the, the production arm empowering the writer to, to envision what they want to, want to create. So you, you think that Germany is on a, on a better way? or is that I, th I think it's a learning process. I think that the, um, everybody who's involved, I mean, like, if, if, if you talk to, for example, we talked about Sky, I think that's, that's, that's a place where you have that sort of freedom and, and, and we experience the same now with Netflix to the point where we want to get notes, yeah? <laughs> uh, just like, but they have so much to do. So it's, it's uh, for the writers, it's 
it's just like a heaven, a creative heaven. And uh, but I think um, things will change also with the how do you say like ID and ZDF syndicate, yeah. Yeah. Public, 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 TV. Pub, public TV. So because they feel that their audience is like 65, 70 years old and nobody's watching it. Yeah. Um, and that's not a part of it, it, it because it's not uh, qu uh, high quality mm -hmm. enough. On the, on the contrary, I think it's it, every time I watch a ZDF movie or a Tatort, I'm astounded by the quality. But they miss a whole generation, and now it's going to be two generations mm -hmm. who just don't know it anymore. Yeah? So I think it, it hopefully it, 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 mm -hmm. it will shift, and but, uh, the, the power will stay. In the creative hands. Uh, it was like two years ago, right here, where I asked a producer of this Bergen, the, the Danish, who's an extraordinary series, what's, what's your secret? Tell us. How, how, how? And he said, it's very simple. Uh, the guys from the management do the management, and the guys from the creative department do the writing. And we do this, we do, there's a diversion, there's a category. You do yours and we do ours. But I actually don't see it as being so separated. I, I, I don't mean to contradict you, it's just that I see it differently. I feel like my job as showrunner, as head writer or creator or whatever of the show, is also as a manager. And I think there's a lot of things that go with that. It's part of it is budget because, you know, you never have enough money, but it's also, um, it's everything. It's marketing. It's costume. It's makeup. It's like make it, casting is a huge part of it. It's making the actors feel safe. It's, you know, they're changing hands from director to director, right? Because it's very rare that one director directs an entire series. Actually, it's, you know, it's just a lot of material, right? So you're you're switching directors, and the consistency is me, you know, or me and a couple of other people. And I think that one of the issues that I have with some of the writing programs, like High FF, which is like a dream school, that's where you went to school, right? In yeah. Munich, yeah. In Munich, yeah. I I, uh, I I gave a class there, and I, the thing is, is they separate the writing and the production departments, which I just think is the you, you, you writers have to get out of their pajamas. You know, you have to go to set and hug the actors and be there and be part of the process. You know, that that's that's where I think I wouldn't separate management from. I but mean, it, but it's only possible if you are the showrunner as as you are. Because, but that's so much work that it's um, for a lot of writers it, it just doesn't work. But I think that the only uh, the only work model. Where you have this sort of uh, of, of of creative freedom, yeah. uh, down to the to the last bit, but it's just it's just daring, and you have to have a lot of energy to write everything, and then deal with costume, and then like okay, we wanted to shoot in Cape Town, could it also be? Namibia or what? Actors. I mean, like <laughs> those kind of questions. And I mean, like I imagine the day, the day. I was always wondering that the day of a showrunner would be uh, like 20 hours or something. And, and there's still so much. It's kind of good to do it with your husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. No, I mean, I'm I'm joking. I think there's often examples of there being two people doing things. Sometimes it's like brothers. Sometimes it's married couples, like the good wife That's or true. whatever. But I, and sometimes it's just two people who work. Like Bloodlines has three. Uh, you know, people who've worked together in the past, but. I, the point is, is that the writer, at the end of the day, no one knows the characters and everything as well as the people who wrote it. But the ideal thing would be that the younger writers in the room are also producers. And that's how it works in America. And that's what's so amazing about young American writers, is that they're just like ready to go. You're like, OK, someone has to go and talk to X, Y, Z about X, Y, Z. They're like, right, OK, I'll be back in an hour. You can delegate to somebody to do that. I, in Germany, or at least with our writers, and first of all, writers aren't paid to go the distance as producers. They're just paid to turn in a script. So you, don't, you can't ask them to do that. It, it's very difficult to have the manpower to say, can you go down to the set or can you be on set today because I have to go to the dentist. I mean, whatever, there is no one else. And I think that's what puts a lot of pressure on the process here. And I think you know, when I go to schools like High FF and I see all these people who are learning to write, I feel like that's the thing I want to impart to them the most is like write anything you can ch anything that you can get a chance to write on that gets shot that's how you're going to learn how to be a writer not from writing it in like becoming professors of theoretical television go write a soap opera if they'll let you go on set because you have to learn go write commercials whatever but like go do something where you're going to be able to actually make something because that's where you learn how to, how to yeah. make it you know yeah, that's why so many of the showrunners now in Germany are directors 
Yeah, because yeah, it's because it's a, it, a part of, part of the direction process is is already like right. all of this stuff. So it, it 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 makes sense that you have it, and you have more control because yeah. I think that's what uh, what uh, working in Germany, um, me as for twenty years and you for thirty years or even even longer is just like so the lack of of having control that was. Was was uh, was what a lot of people are afraid of, yeah. So I, I know so many directors who just look at a, at a script and they say, okay, actually it's a good script, but who's behind it? So and they know, oh, it's for ZDF, so I have to cast one of the four leading ladies, uh, yeah. And uh, maybe I don't want to do it, so I will turn it down because it's just like. And I said, really, you are the director? No, no, no. But but who's going to be in the lead and the two, or the four, two, four leads? That's it's, it's it's a decision made by will be made by the ZDF. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, I think but it, it makes a lot of sense. I think this hints a little bit about this. In my opinion, this acute crisis of the public broadcasting in, in Germany right now. And if you look, especially at the Nordics, that um, they very early on found ways to avoid this by first moving the production to web series, to short form content, aimed at young people, aimed not to be broadcast via um, regular TV, but via internet. A scam is a, is a beautiful, yes. um, yeah. beautiful uh, example of a huge global hit, like this small thing turned to a small global hit. Uh, last year we had at Serian Camp um, the makers from Mental and Love Miller, who also to, to very nice ways of how um, responsibility of trying to convey a certain message and certain values and um, can be combined with young and fresh and exciting storytelling. And if you look at Germany, you have this, this encrusted structures that I, I, it seems that are very difficult to unlearn old things and learn new things. And I think sometimes it seems that they're not even willing to do this this is like a like a toxic like a like a but we're, spite now we don't move at all we're yeah, yeah dealing here excuse me we're dealing here with the german tv this is an enormous like the, the roman catholic church is a seven billion dollar enterprise like the ZDF and RD. this is seven billion dollars they get uh, euros they get every year or eight billion and this, and this is what they have, and the most of it, like 65% goes into administration. So you can imagine. It goes into their pensions. Uh, seven, eight billion dollars, just most of it, into yeah. administration. And, about, and there's a lot of, there's a big, all the Angestellten, all the Beamten, all these, these guys who are there for, for the rest of their life, having no personal financial re risk or anything. So of course they are defending positions. We're not talking about now about German TV, yeah. But we all know that there is something coming. And they have all reason to be afraid. And that changes the tone in the interaction, intercommunication between them, mm. very much. And they, for example, another example is bad banks. So it's the old system, yeah, it's, it's ZDF, it's, uh, and, and, but it's, it, it, works, it worked out brilliantly. Exactly. So maybe that would something, so I, I think there's yeah. a new dawn and, and they, they change it. And, uh, and it's Who the same. Who was the commissioner on that? It was, I think it was ZDF. Yeah. And it was a very strong uh, producer, Lisa Blumenthal, I think that's mm -hmm. the name. Yeah, and it was her. also her, her, her idea and a very strong head writer and a brilliant director. And, and uh, it worked out perfectly. So I think. Perfect story. Yeah, but who, who from ZDF commissioned ZDF. it? Uh, actually, I don't know. It's interesting, here, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about alliances. Like the alliance. yeah, the director author producer alliance is a formidable new form of alliance because this is about fun of making each other happy with what we do, working on something with enthusiasm and optimism instead of just passing these uh, trying to uh, um, sir, uh, uh, the obstacles um, clean your, your way for the, uh, uh, and, and just in fight instead of uh, working together. This is something that we feel here is happening. Let me just add something because we were talking about European perspectives so from the director's standpoint. And I think, for example, my way and a lot of the directors I know is we were looking for the genres or for the stuff which is exciting and new abroad. So I was, I, I, um, I went to the US and really tried to make a Hollywood movie and, and I did. And, um, but the experience was mixed, I have to say. So, but right now we don't have to uh, get out of Germany because everything we are interested 
interested, and I'm talking for a lot of directors, female and male directors, spy stories, um, movies about World War II. I mean, like, I'm super excited about the sport, something I will immediately watch, yeah. Uh, Deutschland 86, and, um, and it, it's, it's all this genre is coming out of Germany or out of Europe right now. There is no need to go to the US anymore or even to go to Great Britain. Which, and, and this is, and, and, and it's so nice. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice. And, the, and it's so satisfying because original German stories, yeah, it's like Acht Tage or Deutschland 86, or I think the, Das Boot, I think this will be a global hit, yeah. It's German stories for the global audience. So it, 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 it Everything turned around. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. So, I think. Is it just a new generation coming up, or would you say that the pressure of Amazon and Netflix is also changing the situation here in Germany? I think both. I think the the um, there's a whole new generation who stopped watching normal television because they say because it's they say it's, it's there's nothing for me on there and uh, and at the same time I think we we do a lot of big mistakes that there was only comedies and and really tough art house in in German cinemas yeah? which is annoying for producers for writers extremely and for directors and I think it was a mistake. As you, as you see, I mean, like yeah. pitching Deutschland 83 as a, as a feature movie, even for Pro7, like five years ago, you would get, you would have gotten a no. Yeah, I can guarantee it. Why? I don't know. Because there was no proof. Pro7, not, do they make movies? Pro, yeah, yeah, for example, or just like RTL or, or anyone. Yeah, I, I don't know. They it's certainly just like wouldn't a, commission it now. Yes, they would. I mean, yeah. No, they wouldn't. No. I, I think it changed, really. I think they would. They didn't recommission the show. No, I mean, you mean like Prozine? <laughs> no, RTL. Uh, RTL. They did not recommission the show. We had to move, we moved broadcasters. I know. But so don't no. you think they would, they would do now? No, well, maybe. Six, me, six months later, I don't maybe. know. Maybe. <laughs> I think, I think cha things change yeah. so rapidly. And I think like, for example, if, if, if Sky will start with this board, yeah, I think we will see finally a lot of more World War II stories. Yeah, and I love I love the whole genre. And I feel and like we only have World War. It's I feel like we live in a different planet. Like generation war. The, there, I feel like German TV used to just only be event movies about World War II. I feel like I mean Das Boot is really special, but like generally and never want to see a swastika like unfurled on uh, down onto Den Linden again. No, but, no, 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 I don't agree. I don't agree. And especially in, 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 in cinemas, you just don't see, you, you only see a hardcore art house. But name something exciting, ex exciting about World War II in, in German cinemas for the last 10, 10 years. Made in German cinema. Yeah. That's yeah. 2005. <laughs> Yeah, 2005 or Downfall was 2004, and or I, I did a movie called Napola in 2004 as well. It's a long time ago. Yeah, because it, it, probably it's no longer the the the, the, the ticket to uh, an Oscar nomination, or uh -huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a time when you yeah. did a, a German movie about the Third Reich that was your ticket to get a nomination at least for the Oscar. So it's yeah. a bit. Boring, probably. Well, we have to live without years. that. <laughs> and I, I think we are obsessed with our history, also in television. I mean, I'm the one to blame with the sport and Babylon Berlin, but that's why I was so happy to get eight days in in, uh, in the hands because we we finally wanted to find something contemporary because we're so obsessed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always safe ground, of course, to do something that is in in the past because everyone can rely to it in one way or another mm -hmm. and says, yeah, yeah, that's the way it was, I remember it, or, oh, that's funny how the, the, the haircuts were. 
Um, but to do, <laughs> to do a show that takes place today or to, tomorrow, I w I'd love to do a near future show. Mm. Um, uh, it's, it's tough. It's a tough so, thing. We always also, joke about, oh, sorry. sorry. No, we just always joke about our show that for young people, it's science fiction. It's like, imagine a world. Berlin is divided. There's a wall down the middle, and you can't get across. You know? And for all of our young actors who were born after the wall came down, they're all like, I cannot imagine this. Like, Jonas was born in 1990 on the border between Lübeck, which is the west, and mecklenburg vorpommern which is the east. And he's just like, dude, can't imagine it. Like, he just, it's, for him, it's really a science fiction. Yeah, it is. It's my mirror. So in a way, we, that's why you know it's very heightened. But I'm writing a, a contemporary show right now that takes place in England. And uh, it is, it's fun to write about stuff in the present. I mean, it's like that, that's, even though I think when you're writing history, you're always writing about the present in a way. I mean, it's hard. You just kind of are anyway. You know, we started our writers from the day after the Trump election. And so... You know, we were writing about, you know, white men holding on to power and the, you know, things, things come into play. But, you know, there's a lot of interplay between the past and the present. But still, it is seriously challenging also to write about the present and get it in a way to get it be both enough fantasy to, for it to be access, you know, to access the fantasy element and still located in the present. But if you look at the US market, it's like 80 or 90 percent is contemporary. Yeah. Yes. And Brit British, too. Yeah. And it's genre. I mean, I think maybe if we def want to define it more, it, in, in Germany before, that we only had like three genres working. Yeah, that's it. It's crime, it's comedy, mm. it's uh, lawyer, and maybe uh, hospital stuff. So that was working. I mean, like, and, and that was just a shame. And, and we are talking about the diversity of genre, yeah? from spy to World War II to contemporary to sci-fi to everything. And I think that's the thing which is exciting. And yeah. I just want to add this one sentence. I think that maybe we, um, Germany didn't, in my opinion, didn't do a lot of history, it wasn't that preoccupied with its own history in, in the series. Um, it was just always focused on a certain part of history, and that's why I found it so completely refreshing that the first big show that Sky did was um, Bubble in Berlin, and looking at this one period that wasn't very represented in, in any kind of, the, the last thing you think is about Berlin Alexanderplatz or something like that, and that period doesn't happen anywhere. Sorry. I, th I think uh, you've raised a very fascinating point about this European perspectives. Um, and uh, we touched on it earlier in the, in the two-day workshop. Um, uh, it, it, there, is a, there is an aspect of this which is, is sort of inevitable. I mean, you've forecast a kind of rebirth of the German uh, television um, uh, world. Uh, it, it may be inevitable, but it's also it's very exciting. Um, uh, in Europe, it tends to have a kind of cyclical yo-yo effect. You know, we, we had the Nordic Noir, tremendous success and excitement, and then suddenly, as we discussed earlier, uh, Belgium came into the scene, plucky little Belgium, um, uh, producing the weirdest and most wayward uh, series that I've ever seen, actually, uh, on the small screen. And then you get the, fr the, the French born from the procedural crime dramas, but very gritty, like engrenage and so on and so forth. Um, there is, of course, still the sleeping giant. One of you mentioned the BBC, and you're writing, I was very interested to hear you're writing a, a series set in England, Please Beware, because the... Um, Did I say it was for BBC? No, I, no you didn't. Oh. But you said you were writing a series set in England. It is set it's in England, yeah. yeah. Um, 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 but, of course, beware, because anything to do with England is that there is a kind of swamp there, <laughs> which is otherwise known as Auntie, the BBC, um, which is not fulfilling its mission to produce exciting work for the amount of money that it has to invest, which is enormous. I mean, people in England often, in Britain, often associate the BBC with the, the uh, as being the successor to the Red Army in terms of the amount of people that it employs. Um, um, so one day the BBC might wake up and produce things other than um, uh, either procedural crime dramas or historical dramas or uh, pre-Brexit uh, idealistical dramas about how they see the past. But I think it's very, very exciting what could happen in Germany in the next five or six years, I mean, which is beginning now with Deutschland 86 and the couple of clips that we showed. And maybe this is a cyclical thing. Maybe Germany 
is a fertile ground for the future. And if, if a feeling after this workshop, uh, we leave this workshop f hoping that, I think that's a, gr a great achievement and a great encouragement to you all. I think Tom wanted to say something. Well, the, only, the only thing I wanted to say about writing contemporary stuff is <coughs> it that goddamn iPhone and the goddamn computer. Yes. They turn it the most boring scenes. Yeah. Somebody and you're going like, oh yeah, let's go a close up of the screen now. Oh now let's go back and turn. <laughs> it's just I hate the Not only, only reason I hate writing contemporary stuff. But, uh, you <laughs> also have that problem where with cell phones that there's no in the 80s, right, there was no way to get in touch with somebody who was on the road, right? right? So you have this, like, in, in terms of dramaturgy, that's great. Yeah. Then suddenly when you're like, well, he would have just called him and told him he was late. I know. <laughs> I know. Right? I know. My whole, my, so I've, my whole, I've, I've, I've my, situated the entire story in a Funkloch, which is like what you call, uh, in, what do we call that in English? What, like a place where there, there's no cellular access. Oh, nice. Like, it's not, it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, this is just such a drag. Like, there's no. <laughs> well, fortunately, there are a lot of places in Britain exactly. where there is I no reception. That. That's what gave me the idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes, no mobile access. <laughs> there's, a, there's a show from France that is exactly the, the, the point. It's on Blanche. It's just about this small town. and. All the all the drama, all the crisis can only be created because there's no reception there at all. I love that. Let, I have let, to let, see that. We have to tell me what that's yeah. called. Yeah, that's funny. Let me just add something because we we, we talking about contemporary shows and and, and 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 the new generation you were, were talking about. There's, for example, it's very interesting the production company of Ach Tage Neue Super. So it's it's a young production company and, and know they and I know them pretty well and I know that all of the three producers wanted to do um, movies for the cinema in the beginning. So but everything and they they looked at the so and they, they looked at each other. And said, do we have an idea for something like Fuck Your Good? No, but we don't want to do this something. So what are we actually watching all day? Series and it's a true story. So they came up with uh, uh, with with the story of Acht Tage. And um, one, I think one of the producers, Raphael, he's also the showrunner, right? So, and I think it's it's a fascinating story. So, and, and this was like three film students, and now it's one of the most significant and production companies I'm in Germany, and they're doing another series. And I think that's also, which is really interesting. And I think the way they are so successful is because they are at the right age, and they know. Uh, what everybody else is watching. And I would just want to add that um, when we're talking about these big shows like Deutschland 83 and 86 and Bubble in Berlin and Bad Banks, um, that exactly Neue Super did something like Hinderfing. I can only, if, if you haven't seen it, um, it's a very great show and it shows that you can, on a budget, do something very fresh and exciting mm -hmm. that I think. Um, it, I was really surprised that something that, the, like the Bavarian uh, Bayerische Rundfunk, the, the, the local station, commissioned something like this because it's very against uh, what they normally do. It's a very dark story about a mayor of a small town addicted to drugs and all the, the trouble he gets in. And, but I think that, that is exactly the kind of, of people we need to, to tell yeah. new and kind so of stories. The, the big question is, as a Bayerische Rundfunk, why let them go to Sky with eight days? So just grab them. No, because and, that's the way it is here. Yeah, but then... Um, if you have a, if you have no, a company like Neue Super, grab so them and, and, and uh, make them work for you for the rest yeah, of... Yeah, I think when you yeah. talk to some people from the Bayerische Rundfunk, there are like, they always talk about these different forces inside the, 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 the institution, that you have the people who want to do something new and exciting, like I'm Serafina, which is, if you go to any of the, of, the, of the serious festivals in Europe, this is always cited as one of the most innovative shows being produced in Europe right now, worldwide, doing a... Uh, uh, I'm Serafina, this Snapchat show they did, a series that's only broadcast on Snapchat. And it's like um, broadcast live. They, they write it, um, I think, a day before they, they shoot it. And it's a team of three people shooting it. It's very innovative, very, very forward thinking. And um, you have th things like Das Institut, which is also compared for a, for a German comedy show, is very um, just radical new things, like making fun of, of Germany in a way that, that um, we wouldn't have dreamt of some years ago. At the same time, you have people who let something like Neue Super go and 
don't want to, to go into this direction of something new. So I think it's not an entity that wants to do one thing and goes into one direction. There are these forces trying to, to, to steer the ship into, and this why it goes zigzag. Uh, I think one, because you're kind of an international public here, or international group yeah. here, so, one has to just clarify one thing about the Bayerische Rundfunk. Um, um, uh, you, you know, for, for 10 years of my life, I was forced, uh, out of my job to be a Rundfunkrat at the Bayerische Rundfunk. And I think what a lot of people may not realize uh, if they're from, from, uh, from England is that, you know, the Rundfunk is uh, ruled, so to speak, by a, a, run, a, a Rundfunk board, which is party political. On one side of the table, is one party. On the other side of the table are representatives of the other party. And there are only very few cactuses, as they're known, uh, the cacti. Um, and the cactuses <laughs> are the people who don't belong to any party, people like me, who are appointed because they run the Staatsoper or the Staatstheater or whatever it is. And they are always outnumbered by the SPD and by the CSU. So when decisions come, when the uh, program directors uh, uh, come and uh, um, uh, submit what their plans are, you always get a huge battle between the conservative CSU and the minority party, uh, uh, the SPD. And, and then the cactuses try and push the innovation, but they don't have a chance because they're outnumbered six to one basically. And that's the system. And of course, that doesn't exist. In, in you just gave the perfect uh, image of the dilemma of the German film industry. That they are, they are party members of a party sitting in, uh, on opposite sides of a table um, deciding over culture and about, uh, about movie making and radio making. And this is it. This is uh, so absurd. And the arguments become personal and political rather than mm. artistic. We have all experienced that many movies which we have written or directed which have never been broadcasted, th this can happen by, for us, totally unknown reason. You, it is not that you, they don't like your script or whatever. They, they, it is something else. It can be a political decision behind it, an economic. Or it, it's, uh, all this is a very, uh, there's an inner circle of movie making in, in Germany that is now kind of dissolving slowly. Uh, we should probably yeah, grasp that chance and uh, get into, into alliances and, and, and make our own statement here. That means this is what we have to offer. Trust us and let's see what happens. Well, you are, you are doing that. Everybody's doing it now. I think so. I hope so. But it, it, it was, I mean, this is of course 10 years ago, it was very impressive. I don't know how any how many of you follow Bavarian politics or German politics, but if you have an interior minister like Joachim Herrmann, uh, a very, very conservative man with a very deep bass voice, who knows that he has the votes in parliament, he can kind of manipulate a huge Rundfunkrat Sitzung session and simply effectively censor certain plans that will not be at all conceived or even born. Yeah, and the, um, there's one thing or one one insight that I um, that I want to. I think we have to. Do we have a little bit more time? Do we have to wrap up? Yeah, oh, okay, wonderful. Um, but this is maybe um, raising perspective, um, opening up to again to to the um, how how this um, cooperation between Europe or this exchange between Europe and, and the U.S. works uh, or may work is um, that Matthew Graham, the creator of uh, Life on Mars, and I think one of the last things he did was um, adaptation um, of Childhood's End um, for a sci-fi channel. Um, and he's, he's from, from Britain. And he said that a lot of when he worked in the writer's room for Childhood's End in, in the US, that a lot of the writers there were really, really envious of the kind of, of series that get made in Europe right now. Because they said that 
you have a you have a creative freedom. And if you look at the, the whole thing, at what's happening in the Nordics, if you have what's happening in, in countries like Belgium, Spain is suddenly producing um, interesting stuff of, after being more um, confined to telenovelas. France is doing really great stuff. They have a language barrier that that's that's uh, difficult to overcome. And now from Italy, you have Gomorrah, 1992. Italy, I was going to say that's the, the one that the, no one's mentioned. Italy is amazing. Yeah. Stuff. So th and yeah. they always say that, uh, or the, he said I mean, that the writers Italian. there. They really um, said, what do I have to do to be able to work on a European show? Because I want to, to have those, this kind of freedom to tell this kind of stories and not work in this. I think it's really difficult this, to the generalize. You know, grass is greener who, on the other side? Yeah, I or? mean, as somebody who's working in wherever, I, I, you know, I, I think it's hard to generalize. I think, it, again, it depends on the people you work with and finding the right people who are crazy in the same way and are going to go down that crazy road with you. You know, I don't know if it's, if it's national. Um, I think it, it's a risk even to define it as such. Like, I'm not working in England. I'm working with like, the crazy people who wanted to work on this project. Or, and in America, you know, I'm obviously primarily American. So when I'm in America, I meet a lot of people I'd like to work with. or You know what I mean? It's, it, and yeah, sure, there's 400 TV shows being made in America, but I only need to make one with them or one with the right people. You know what I mean? At, the, at a time, anyway. So it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know if, it's, if you can really say it's better in one place or another. Don't you know? mean so much the people, because um, I think that um, but more like the structure. But there's so many that, different structures. You know, if you're working for HBO, it's one thing. If you're working for, you know, uh, ABC, it's another if you're working for a small, uh, you know, like, a, let's say, AMC or so. I don't know. It, it just, you know, like in this case, you know, we do our show with Sundance, uh, which is part of AMC, Deutschland 86. I mean, um, you know, there, like, there's like two people there, you know, so it's not, there isn't a superstructure, you know, and it, I think it just depends on the situation. I mean, listen, I live here, my children live here. I'd be super happy if like everything took place in Kreuzberg, you know, and I never had to go anywhere. But <laughs> that's just not the, you know, I also come weirdly come up with things that don't take place in Kreuzberg. So then you travel and you find those crazy people. <laughs> but I don't know. It's, I, yeah, I think you're right, though. I think things are much better in Germany than they were before uh, in a sense that um, there's so much more competition. I suppose that's what it is. It's that it's not, I've never worked for public TV, so I don't actually know anything about it. So that's, I, I can't speak to that, but um, I think it's exciting that there's different ways to, you know, skin a cat, so, and more and more here. Right? And, and also more and more people to collaborate with, which is what makes it, because you know, one thing, it just has to be said, like, this is super labor intensive work. Like, it's, it takes all your time and everything you think about, and there's tons of details, and you have to be like a total crazy nerd obsessive to even choose to do this. So, you have to find the other people who, it's the journey is the destination, I guess is the best way to put it. It's really cool when you finally get to premiere it and people like it or they don't like it, but really it's about the journey that you have to go on to make it because it just takes your life. This is your life, you know? As my agent likes to say, uh, he always says, this is your lifetime, which I think is, is just a funny way of using English, but it's so cute that he says it. He's like, this is your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> um, we have a question back there. I don't know yet, it's ah. working now. And uh, those news, um, sometimes you get this feeling you understand what happens when you watch the right TV show. Um, I had this feeling with, with Deutschland uh, um, 83, also um, which I watch at the same time, Weissensee. Um, you really got this feeling, okay, now I sometimes feel like I understand what happened in, in the 80s. And sometimes uh, shows can do this um, also 
so historical shows, but of course sometimes political events develop over uh, yeah a hundred years, and then maybe you watch the news and now you, you understand what, what, what's happening because you've got like the depth and the length of, of some TV show who exp basically explained uh, what, what happened there. So uh, what, what my idea is about is maybe TV shows uh, yeah kind of especially in Germany maybe change their 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 um, yeah their their meaning um, because maybe they can can be the better news in, in some way because they do have the depth they do have the length to to explain some of the stuff and then maybe fiction um, kind of kind of changes uh, um, um, I feel like in Germany we had like this distinction be between this is the real this is the news and this is fiction this is just comedy this is just a, a crime this is just drama um, and I feel like it's kind of changing um, yeah I would be interested uh, if you have any thoughts thoughts on that I didn't get the question <laughs> And the question is if, if it's just in my mind or if it's actually changing um, so that, that, that fiction can, can become some, some way of news because it, it actually... That's terrifying. Happens. So it helps to contextualize the news. Yes. Or history. I mean, yeah. Because mm. it's the new story. We like to think of it as history as metaphor, hmm. you know, because it's a little dangerous to think of it as being news or, you know. Or history, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, yesterday, Gerard yeah, Meyer gave us a, a, a wonderful encapsulation mm. of history, of storytelling. Mm. And, 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 and I mean, we all know that the, the histories in, in ancient Rome are part fiction. So mm. maybe, I think, uh, if I could elaborate on your question, could you become, for better or for worse, terrifying or not terrifying, the new historians? <laughs> Tell that to the historians. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I would. I mean, I, say, I, I think the historians would have something to say about that, right? And 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 rightly so. I mean, I think, and this is what I was, you know, trying to talk about earlier. Is there is a very interesting space that opens up where narrative can. Um, can enlighten us um, where historical narrative can add nuance, um, but it, it, it's something that we've been talking about over the course of the last two days. Like, should it come with a kind of warning label that says, you know, more clearly to people, this is all made up. This is not how things actually happened. Instead of the standard, you know, this may have been altered or the kind of hedging thing that people um, have traditionally done in the past. And it's something that I've been wondering is whether whether in terms of these pendulum swings and the different moments that we find ourselves in as a population, as a society, whether there aren't times where that kind of, um, what, is, what, what is from a creative standpoint and from a narrative standpoint, a very exciting and entertaining um, poetic license and, and um, an ability to play with history and to play with facts, um, and whether we don't start to relinquish some of that license a little bit, not all of it, but some voluntarily, and to actually start to research the importance of saying of these kinds of, because we've been hybridizing genre for a long time, and as I say, that's fun and productive, and we like it, but there I see a reassertion of people saying, actually, this is history and it matters, that we understand that this is history, and this is fiction and it matters that we understand that this is fiction, because from you know, a psychological standpoint, right, that the, the, the basic difference between a kind of classical understanding of madness and sanity is that you don't have the same shared reality as everybody else. And, and when, you don't understand, when you don't have that shared ground as a society is when we start to get into that insanity. So I need to say, as somebody who wears both hats, right, I'm a professor of literature and a cultural historian. So I, I, I celebrate both types of, of encounters with the past. Um, but I think we have to recognize that, that and, it, and it's back to my point about saying TV shouldn't adjudicate uh, or shouldn't drive the judicial agenda, and I'm not sure it should drive the historical agenda either. I think we need to be careful about just throwing all of that stuff up in the air and saying let it fall where it may. Well, credit where credit, 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 credit is due. One thing one should say is that as far as the Crown is concerned, they did actually give publicly a, a, a warning that it was not accurate. 
But I think it's also important to see what stories we're telling, because if we put this label on that this was an invention or what, I think um, people nowadays, more people are getting a voice nowadays than ever before, stories that haven't been told before, because before books were written by people who were like literate, which for a large portion of, his, portion of history were white men. Um, and now there's just a voice being given to other people as well, which I think is important mm -hmm. to recognize. Um, but I, I still think that um, fiction can you help to understand um, history, because I think one one of the watershed moments for me watching series is the remake of Battlestar Galactica, where it's the end of the first season, beginning of the second season, um, where they fight back. Uh, the uh, silence like forced them to live on this planet, and they fight back, and they get more and more agitated, and they don't know what to do, and so the, it's a last resort. Um, they suicide bomb. And this is during the time where um, the, the insurgency happens in Iraq, and you suddenly see, and it only happens after, after two episodes of, of uh, um, developing the story, that you understand that you're suddenly um, sympathizing with, with the people that the news tell you that you should hate and, and see their perspective. And I think this is one of the things that fiction or any kind of fiction maybe you should do to create empathy for, 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 for a perspective that you did, couldn't take earlier. I mean, we take a ton of license with history. You know, there were no women at high levels in the Stasi. Yeah, but fuck it. Sorry, but like I'm writing a show. It's, me, it's all about the women, you know? So it's it just, I don't know. I, I think, I, do we need a disclaimer at the beginning that says actually there was no women's bathroom in the entire building? I don't know, you know? That's true. Yeah. And the secretaries had to cross the street to go to the bathroom, but it is, it is. yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's pretty obvious when you watch our show that it, it is a fantasy. I, I mean, it, it, that said, there's a lot of real history in it that is really interesting. The, and we, we definitely keep the timeline legitimate. You know, that's something that we talk about a lot. It's like as long as the backdrop mm. of, but we're setting, setting fictional characters free in that historical sure. space. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's both. Yeah. You know? but, but I think it's good to have a disclaimer on a show, something like The Crown, for example. So mm -hmm. I wasn't aware, for example. So I take, I, I wasn't interested in, in Elizabeth's uh, crown at all. And, but then I watched the show because my wife made me do it, yeah. And now I love it, yeah. Love and it. I, I love it, yeah. And, and so, you and watched so, the royal wedding, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, you yes, did. yes. So and I enjoyed it as well. Yes, you did. So, um, but I actually take it for granted, yeah. So it, so it, it this is a show where you should have a disclaimer. Well, yeah, I think so. Just to be so to clarify what yeah. I was saying, as I say, I'm a, I'm a professor of literature first and foremost. I, yeah. I live and deal in fiction, and I teach fiction um, through the lenses you were talking about, about how it can bring history to life for us and make us ask different kinds of questions. Um, although I am wary of the empathy arguments, um, because as I always remind my students, racists read novels too. Um, and so the idea that the empathy argument that, that going through either fiction or, or, narr or, or visual narrative, whatever kind of narrative mode, um, increases our empathy is a kind of, it's an implicit special pleading, right, that we will become better people if we, um, if we engage with narrative, with imaginative, empathetic narrative, we will yeah. become better people. Um, the evidence doesn't show that at all. Um, there, there is almost no evidence that, that actually engaging with fictional stories makes you a better person. If it were, we would all be better people, because we've been engaging with fictional stories for centuries and we haven't progressively, <laughs> uh, we haven't demonstrably progressed as a species. Um, but so, but that as a as a caveat, I was playing devil's advocate there to, to yeah. a great extent. Um, my sympathies would probably would come down on the side of, of fiction and poetic license. But I just think it's an important question to ask. And I spend enough time now with historians and in the space of history that I think that we we maybe need to. Tr and I'm sure I'm not going to be the fact police saying you have to you know give some kind of catalog of where you deviated from known fact as mm -hmm. if you could do that anyway uh, or would want to do that. But rather that just as as the people who are working through these ideas and and in inhabiting the space of history, it does seem to me, I wrote this in a, in a review I did of a, of a novel that's based on the life of Zelda Fitzgerald, which became the basis for the miniseries Zed, right, or Zelda, rather, and it was a book called Zed. Um, and um, I uh, was very, very angry at this book um, because she took all the licenses imaginable 
um, had absolutely no sense of, of, of ob uh, discernible obligation to any truth about these people's lives, mm -hmm. um, to any you know way in which you could conclude that that either Scott or Zelda Fitzgerald was really like that. Um, and they're and they're people that I work on. They're, they're the people I know the best. I work a lot on them and, the, and on their period. No discernible interest in historical accuracy or verisimilitude. And I'm not doing the pedantry of they didn't have shoes like that in 1982, yeah. but things like in 1922 they didn't say fuck off. You know, like like get get the get something right. Get the language right. Get the character right. Get the historical period right. Get something right. Or don't capitalize on the historical moment and the popularity of the moment that you're capitalizing yeah. on. And so I do think that as storytellers, even, we have an obligation when we want people to be interested in our story of World War II or we want people to be yeah. interested in our story of the Stasi, I think we do have obligations to at least some sense of the larger yeah. of, of the larger historical claims or characters or, or points that we need to be making. And we shouldn't necessarily throw it all up for grabs, but as I say, I may totally disagree with myself 30 seconds later because I'm really right on a, on a divide about this, but I think it's an important question to ask. You want to know the most terrible anachronism that we have in 83? Yes, And every I do. time I see it, it makes me cringe, is that he sneezes like this. <laughs> And nobody did that when I was growing up. I don't know where that came from, but until my kids were taught to do that in Kita, like a nursery school, I had never seen anyone sneeze into their elbow. When I was growing up, everyone just sneezed into their hand. And he sneezes on two occasions in 83 into his elbow. So, and every time I'm like, ooh, you know. <laughs> Untruth. Yeah. Like the three and three thing from Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> yeah. Although Inglorious Bastards is a great example of a World War II movie that's amazing. And all fantasy. <laughs> and I love every minute of that movie. I, I don't this agree is where at all. Our taste <laughs> when, yeah. when, when I saw it at the premiere, I thought this is the worst movie I saw <gasps> in my whole life. Really? It's such you can't I mean like I was I was shocked, yeah. And then maybe. everybody was jumping up and said, It's a masterpiece, so maybe I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you yeah, well, it's a whole new dis discussion. You just what he did is something you just can't do with 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 German history. I think it was disgusting. No, I didn't. Oh. You mean the Tarantino buster? Yes. But there was one very interesting thing about it. I, I studied his method because I am in, in, inclined to uh, to think that you're right. But there's something very genius about it. Um, he is a master of creating scenes. Just scenes, mm -hmm. and uh, and he writes another scene, and they are juxtaposed. That's what he is doing. They can be interchanged in between, uh, um, but the whole movie is just a collection of very very interesting um, scenes which are accomplished. Uh, the introduction to of, of, of uh, Glorious Bastards is a very great one, and other scenes too. So and his his his, his technique, scene and, mm? his technique mm. is, is is exemplary. I I, I, I tell this to my friends. Let's just find about five or let better ten great scenes, and that's the that's what we need for ninety minutes or hundred minutes. What I'm doing now with my American fellow uh, writer. We are writing a, a, a something. I, why did I sign this contract? Is uh, about backsteigen, about what is that mountaineering, about Mr. Messner, who is the greatest mountaineer of all times. But I'm the worst mountaineer of all times, and I've never been interested in that. So my, my technique now is the, the Tarantino way: is find ten great scenes, <laughs> create them, and then do something in between and kind of link them together, <laughs> kind of because well, backsteigen, mountaineering is basically up and down again. It is like yeah. deep, like deep sea diving is down and up again. That's the whole story, and the rest is conflict. But while you are writing the most dramatic scenes, um, you feel this boredom coming up, creeping up your legs, and feeling that you were petrified um, writing all that stuff, which you, you would never do. Why, why would I ever go up there? But then I recall again um, the Tarantino way. It's like finding on the way up, which is totally meaningless and stupid, <laughs> and the way down, great moments. Yeah. And, uh, fas and, and try, to fas I try to fascinate myself. Yeah. With it because we, we're, we're not talking about writing here. We we're talking about all these other processes of, uh, yeah. of, uh, da -da -da -da, of the whole business. But I, um, I think it is time to, uh, to open a writing school with directors and producers together, and everybody should explain his way of uh, his technical approach, his, his the dirty tricks 
of, of entertainment. For instance, the balance between truth and beauty, which is so difficult to maintain because there's so, <laughs> there's so many things to, to tell about that. But uh, just for, for one thing that I think that even when they, I, I saw your Napola movie, which was, I think, a great movie. Thank yeah? you. Um, we need that this, this German treasure box of histories is this, these 12 years from 33 to 45. Many things happened there which have, cannot happen again. And um, so we should open this and use it to, to the, to, to the Do maximum. Do you feel that it's been closed? That's what, I, that's what I feel. I've been waiting all my life to, to get the chance to write great stories of this time. It must not be as as officer Standartenführer in the KZ. It can be different stories about fear, about repression, about all the other stuff. There is so much, so much in there. And now is the time to open this box and tell the stories. That's why I'm, I'm totally agreeing with you. <laughs> I agree, but, 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 it's, but it's, it's fascinating that from your point of view, it's, uh, it's, it's all there is, all there alone. Being a yeah. dead horse. Listen, <laughs> I, I am a Jew who is married to a German who has lived in this country for like 17 years. Mm -hmm. For the first five years I lived here, I thought about nothing but World War II. My parents show up to visit me for Christmas with like Wehrmacht under one arm and like you know, Hitler's willing executioners under another arm. Like, all they read is books about World War II. Mm. It's all anyone ever talked about when I was growing up. It, you know, and now I'm married to a German, which was, I mean, they got over it. It's been a long time, but still it was pretty dramatic at the beginning. And, uh, and I live in Berlin. You know, my father cried on every street corner when he first came to visit me. It was like he could not get over it. I, the idea, I feel like what, if you're raised in America, the only thing you know about Germany from movies, and it's truly from movies, is World War II. You know, it took me a really long time to get out of the kind of a movie vernacular understanding of, of this country, you know? It's, it's really, it's so interesting that you see it that way. I'm fascinated yeah, by yeah. that. And, 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 you know, uh, I, I think Americans, it's almost like for the first time ever in the past five years, they've thought, oh, maybe there's other things going on in Germany except World War II. We thought it was still like that, you know? That's what... That's why people love uh, Berlin because... Yes. The way that... Yes, and my parents, by the way, love Babylon Berlin. They only watched two episodes of Deutschland, but whatever. But they have watched <laughs> all of Babylon, and they love it. And it's, you know, because also they feel there is a strong, you know, <laughs> metaphorical, history as metaphor thing about what's happening in the US. And they, they're fascinated by that. And I think a lot of my friends in New York also are watching Babylon. And it's like, it's just the first time in the past few years that people have thought about something else. So it's, I mean, Das Boot is very special because that movie, everybody loves the movie, and now it's being, un it's almost like a we close or whatever, like that, you know, no exit. It's like people trapped. It has a very special story, right? That, that I don't think of so much as being World War II, even though, of course, it is mm -hmm. in the same way. But I'm I find that so interesting. Yeah. That's like that we should like have dinner sometime and unpack that. Yeah. I would love to know what, what you mean. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and then you, then you can explain me why you love Inglorious Bastard so much. But but I know maybe <laughs> maybe because I like things that are sort of heightened and because and I was and the realism. You know, there's plenty of really real scary movies about what it was like to be in a concentration camp or in World War II or whatever. And I, of course, I'm identified with the Jews in these movies. So it's, I see it from a different perspective. And the thing about Inglorious Bastards, it was, it was so heightened and kind of crazy. And I, I appreciated the levity, even though it was really brutal. It was just a different way of looking at it. Whereas if I see like Nacht und der Wolfen, I just think like, oh my God, you know, I, I never want to see another concentration camp ever on screen. Interesting, yeah. You know, so I think it's, but I, of course, I was raised seeing all the movies. Yeah, yeah, World because that's, so that's, and I think Tarantino too, I think he just took the, it as a canvas, yeah, and just, it just, he just did a, a genre movie, said, okay, where should I take place, or French Revolution, or I don't care, oh, well, Nazi Germany, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's another yeah. conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we just, do, whole, uh, do what we can do a whole conference on that. <laughs> so I think um, thank you all for sharing. Thank you all for participating. <laughs>